holding it down with help from God, and we thank God for their leadership in worship this morning. For a few moments, I want to talk from the subject, wisdom to live by. Wisdom to live by. Can you say that with me? Wisdom to live by. Now, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight. Lord, you are our strength, and Lord, you are our redeemer. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Wisdom to live by. Yesterday, I was driving to the church. I was making my way here for food pantry, and I was on the lodge, M10, and two cars on M10 almost had me to pull over and pray just to get my bearings. The first was a little small compact car, I think one of the newest smallest Chevys. I didn't even know they could go that fast. And it hurled past me or hurtled past me or it flew by me doing at least 100 miles an hour. I was doing about 65, maybe 70. Young people, if you're watching online, uh, do what I say, don't do what I do because it's a 50 mile, a mile an hour uh, highway or uh, freeway. And so I'm, I'm moving along at a decent clip, but this car I saw coming upon me, I thought to myself, if I hadn't looked in my side view mirrors and made a decision to change a lane suddenly, there would have been a major accident. I said to myself, unless he or she was rushing someone to the hospital or they were en route to the hospital themselves, and even in that situation, you want to make it to the hospital, I thought to myself, what an unwise way to drive. What an unwise decision to drive dangerously like that. And then two minutes later, as I pass the Livernois exit and made my way around that core, core curve towards seven mile, I heard a roaring engine like a race car. Now understand again, I'm doing about 67 miles per hour and then suddenly coming up right behind me as I exited seven mile was one of those Dodge SUVs. One of those SUV chargers, because that's basically what it was, was, perhaps with one of those Hemi engines, those turbo engines. It was moving at such a rapid clip right behind me. And then once we made it up to seven mile, and then I made that turn toward the west, he or she drove by me, drove by others, and wove in and out of traffic and drove through a couple of red lights. I pray, Lord, have mercy and protect us, protect them and wake them up because how they are driving, how they are maneuvering is stupid. It is unwise. Early Saturday morning. Well, sisters and brothers, beyond the problem of reckless driving here in Detroit, and it is a problem, there is a problem with reckless living everywhere. Many people from generations X to Z, you can even throw in a few baby boomers, have heard and they know and remember that there are certain guidelines for living, certain values that have been passed down from our sources of ancient wisdom, morals and ethics passed down from our ancestors. I'm talking about those ancestors who left a time-tested, life-lived-in-the-trenches wisdom to us. And yet many, some in high places, others just ordinary folk, go about going through their life. Just ordinary folk, 
Folk in high places too. They go through life, speeding through life, ignoring the rules of life, ignoring the values and the tenets of our best faith traditions, not realizing that unless they slow down, unless they turn around, unless there's a new embrace of wisdom, a crash is coming. There is an African proverb which says that if a man or a woman if their heads are so full of arrogance, they will then not have enough room for the pouring in of wisdom. I like that. In the book of Proverbs, which is attributed to the God-given genius of King Solomon as the author, in, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4 and verse 7, Solomon says, wisdom is the principal thing. It's the primary thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get some understanding. Get understanding. I, I like that, too. Oh, but that's not hip enough for some of you all, especially some of you young folks who might be watching later online, on, on YouTube. Well, then there's Wiz Khalifa, uh, the rapper. In his catchy rap song, Knowledge and Wisdom, Khalifa, after talking about taking care of his family because he's matured and being there for his children because he's matured and not doing dumb stuff and putting away money, stacking chips because he's matured, he says, made it out of the ghetto and made it out of the system. If I talk about it, guarantee that I will get it done. Stacking money every day because he can't be short when the rent comes. But it's not all about the money and gain, it's about the knowledge and gaining wisdom. Calvary and friends and kin, the African and Hebrew ancestors along with Wiz Khalifa all agree with the universe and the spirit of God as they exhort for all the need to pursue the value and presence and power of wisdom. And they instruct us that we need to be chasing after wisdom. All of us as human beings need to be open vessels, human vessels, human repositories, receptacles for the pouring in and the pouring out of wisdom, especially divine wisdom. But why, you might ask, preacher, why is wisdom so important? Why does this power, what? power does this six letter word give to us and what does it mean when we use the word wisdom first to define it let's unpack and define what wisdom is not sometimes to flesh out the definition of a certain term or a certain word or a certain concept one must begin to define it by negation by comparing it to what it is not. This has the effect of shooting down misconceptions and blowing up mythologies. So what is wisdom? Wisdom is not a title. Wisdom is not a position in the church or at your job. Wisdom is not a trophy. Wisdom is not accolades. Wisdom is not degrees on the wall. Wisdom is not popularity, nor is it physical beauty in the mirror or charisma on bright display. That's not wisdom. And wisdom is not always popular. It is not always welcome. You see, sisters and brothers, wisdom is not even necessarily the acquisition of more and more information and knowledge and data. That's not wisdom. Just to have a new data piles stored up in us, in the storehouses of our minds and hearts. There are a lot of folk walking around who know a lot. They have studied a lot. They've read a lot of books. They have seen a lot and been a lot of places and can write and recite eloquently, effusely, and quote facts easily and repeatedly for days on end. They've got it like that. And some folk misconceive 
that what they then have is wisdom. But sometimes the same knowledgeable people are still bankrupt in the wisdom department. Also, as we think about wisdom and what it means at its core, wisdom is not something that we grasp after and control for our own selfish purposes and motivations. That's not wisdom. That's not wise. Instead, at the core, at the ethos, wisdom always has an Ubuntu component to it. What is Ubuntu? Ubuntu is the West African philosophy that, which says, because we are, I am. And I am because we are. We are known together. We are defined together. We grow wise together. Hence, true wisdom is not only for us as individuals, as we sail the ship of life without being concerned about the safety and sustainability of other ships that are trying to make it across the seas of life. Wisdom is not something we grasp tightly, narcissistically. Oh, politicians, do you hear me? Wisdom is not something that we grasp narcissistically so that we can manipulate good people for wicked purposes vulnerable people for evil ends that that's not wisdom y'all that that's not wisdom instead wisdom always shows up to work for the common good especially the good as defined by trans transcended and divine powers because there is automatically and intrinsically something good about wisdom that surpasses just the individual and it in fact evades and moves, wisdom evades and moves on when evil tries to clutch it and then use it for its own purposes. So preacher, you've been up a little while now. What is wisdom? You've told us what it's not. What is wisdom then? Well, we've got to stop by the Bible and look at the biblical languages used in the Bible. The Greeks called wisdom Sophia. Sophia, Sophia. And this word, Sophia, is the original word that was translated into the English word, wisdom. And it appears in Greek versions of the Old Testament. Wherever you see the word wisdom in the Old Testament, if you have a Hebrew Bible, and you can go to the store and buy a Hebrew Bible, if you go and buy a Hebrew Bible, especially the Old Testament, the word that you will read across for wisdom is Sophia. And it was used in a version of the Bible called the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament. And it is the word for wisdom used in the Greek New Testament. Can y'all say with me, Sophia? Sophia. Sophia, according to the Greeks, and the, that, that entire region of the world was controlled by Hellenistic or Greek culture at the time of the writing of the New Testament. And according to the Greeks, Sophia is a divine power that enables one to be clever and quick, easy to process information, utilizing a practical skillfulness it has a poetic quality, the Greeks thought, but most of all, it helps persons to, to be prudent or discerning as one factors in the future. Hellenistic or Greek wisdom was linked up with God or the Greek gods. Sophia was described by the Hellenistic world, even by Hellenistic Jews, and Hellenistic Christians. They're in our New Testament, y'all. Hellenistic Jews and Hellenistic Christians. And they defined Sophia as that attractive power in feminine form, which was a part of God or the best gods in helping to create everything that we see that is good. They said, y'all, that's wisdom. That's Sophia. However, probably predating Greek notions of wisdom, we understand that the ancient Hebrews and the North African Jews understood that wisdom, which they call chakma or hakma, that was their word for wisdom, is a spiritual force. It is spirit. And wisdom is the personification of that which helped create and align all that we see in the cosmos 
in its proper place. Wisdom was what was factored in as the sun was created and the moon and the stars and the galaxy. It was wisdom the Jews and the ancient North African Jews thought. Wisdom was present in the act of creation of the untainted universe and world before the fall. And it is the power we need. Look at your neighbor and say, we need wisdom. We need wisdom. It is the power we need to help us to reach God's highest goals and our, our highest goals in God in the most effective and efficient way. Do you have wisdom? Do you? It doesn't just come with gray hair. Do you have wisdom? Divine wisdom. It is not just knowledge, but it is the gift to be able to process and utilize that knowledge for godly and divine ends, for the good of our lives and those around us. Oh, sisters and brothers, the Greeks and the ancient Hebrews and the North African Hebrews, your godly mothers and godly fathers and grandparents and uncles and aunts and cousins who love life and peace and joy and who love people all concurred that wisdom, God's wisdom, God's Sophia, God's chakma, God's hakma is a light that more people in this world need desperately so that wisdom might be lived out. So that wisdom might be exalted over foolishness. So that wisdom might be displayed in diverse people who live in a world filled with so many who are living foolishly and dangerously lost lives. And this is something that King Solomon in our first scripture reading realized early in his life and early in his monarchical reign. We can learn from King Solomon about wisdom, even though he himself was flawed. He was a flawed man. He was a flawed king. He desired wisdom, though. He sought after wisdom. He requested of God to be possessed by a wisdom, a wisdom to live by that was of divine origins. In our text in 2 Kings chapter 2 and 3, David was nearing the end of his life as Beeler read. And by verse 10, the text says that he fell asleep and died. And now the young neophyte King Solomon is beginning his reign. He's just starting out. He's fresh. He's new. Immediately, he is confronted with some tough decisions and possible plots against him, possible plots to overthrow his reign from secret but aggressive enemies. Almost immediately, he had some painful and, 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 and serious decisions to make. Almost immediately, he had some potentially dangerous folk who were threats to the kingdom, so he had them executed. Folk his father warned him to take care of. Among them was Joab. We talked about him last week. He was David's right-hand man. He was David's general. But on his deathbed, David said, I need you to take care of Joab. Because if you don't, he might rise against you. You see, Joab, Joab had David's rebellious son, Absalom, you know, the brother with the flowing hair we talked about, had him murdered. Even after David gave the royal fiat to let the boy live, Joab was the one who took it upon himself and said, I don't care what the king says. I'm going to throw this javelin through him. And then his, his armor bearers did the same thing. Joab had also murdered two other godly prominent men against David's will and wishes. And so Solomon took care of Joab. Now people are looking to King Solomon and the prophets for guidance. He has a vision for Israel, partly passed down to him by his father David. He is about to take on two massive building projects and campaigns, his own palace and a palace of praise for the people of God to worship Yahweh in a temple, Israel's first temple, a temple that would be glorious beyond all other temples in the world. And it is then that Solomon meets this barrier in his life. 
he comes to realize his finitude and his, his uh, mortality and his flaws and, and the fact that he is not transcendent. He realizes that he has limitations. He's already wise enough to know that he needs more of something to help him to deal with the challenges he faces and he yet faces. Solomon knows that he needs a greater pouring out of wisdom divine wisdom. Are you humble enough to admit that you don't know it all? That you don't have it all together? You don't understand all there is to understand about life, your life, other people's lives, what's going on in the church, what's going on in your family. We don't have all of the information that there is. God does though. And this is why we've got to admit we're limited, we're flawed, we don't have it all together, we've got clay feet. We need wisdom, divine wisdom. Are you wise enough to know that you need more wisdom to deal with life as it is? And that is, as it is now coming at us very quickly, life is coming with swift transitions, some enticing invitations that present themselves to us we need to turn away from. Some revolting situations we need to reject right away. But are you wise enough to recognize your current limitations? Say more wisdom. I'm saying it. More wisdom, God. And the holy book says that Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father, King David. Though Solomon did have his flaws, the Bible says right after that sentence about his love for the Lord, that he sacrificed and offered incense on the high places instead of in the dedicated holy spaces, particularly the tabernacle. Solomon was not perfect, though he loved the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord to a degree, but there was still some areas that needed clarification, that needed sanctification, that needed redirection and reexamination. And the same is true for you and me. We have not arrived yet, but God is so good that often too many times to count, too many times to count in my own life, and I bet in your life too, God looks beyond our faults and God sees our needs. Oh, that's a place where you should have shouted right there because it's true for all of us. God looks beyond our faults and sees our needs and seeks to meet our needs, especially when we ask. Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find. Not I don't have it all together, but I'm knocking, Lord, knock, and the door will be open. So God decides to meet Solomon where his needs are in front of God, and God has a desire to intersect those needs with his divine providence and meet those needs. So God decides to meet with Solomon, his servant, and God appears to Solomon in a dream. And basically tells him, Solomon, ask me whatever you desire. Now, I'm no genie in a bottle because I'm much more than that. You can't manipulate me. You can't rub on some bottle and out I pop out. But I am the true God who sits on the throne of all existential reality with ultimate power over all there is. And because you continue to love and respect your father's legacy of following me and because you still love him and respect him and you love me, what do you want me to do for you, Solomon? Sisters and brothers, if God asked you that question, what would be your answer? What do you want me to do for you? More money? More influence? More peace in your home, more joy in your soul. Well, hear how Solomon answers. It is instructive and always already shows a modicum of wisdom at work in Solomon's life. Lord, Lord, I'm thankful that you have made me your servant king in place of my father. I'm in the Bible. Even though in my heart of hearts, I am still a little child who doesn't know how to be king yet. 
I don't know how to conduct myself as king. I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to come in as king in public and private spaces yet. I'm still inexperienced. I'm still wet behind my ears. And I, I don't, I don't want to bring catastrophes on this people because of my neophyte status. So I ask that you grant me an understanding mind to flourish in my assignment to govern your people, help me to discern both the good and the evil. Help me to see and then choose the good over the evil and see and shun evil because my decisions will affect millions. He describes the millions as a great people who cannot be counted. He says, God, I need you. I need understanding. I need discernment. He's really asking, I need wisdom. And the Holy Spirit says, through the holy word, that this answer pleased the Lord. So much so that the Lord says, you, you've asked me the right thing. A heart that desires to do good, a life that understands life, you desire to walk in wisdom. Yes, Solomon, you have asked for the best things. To have my wisdom, which is an understanding and discerning heart, knowing good and evil and then choosing the good, I am going to grant you that supernatural wisdom that you've requested. And on top of that, oh, aren't you glad when God adds to the answer you've been praying, you've been requesting God for, God gives you the answer and he adds to the, that, that answer? On top of that, Given that you didn't ask me what folk usually want from me, you didn't ask for money, you didn't ask for wealth, you didn't ask me to get revenge on your enemies, you didn't ask me for top tier influence, you didn't ask me for a great reputation and honor and long life, and to get uh, the people, get out of messes and setups and breaks downs, you didn't ask for any of that. I'm going to grant you all of that, just as icing on the cake. You're going to have wealth. You're going to have bling bling. You're going to be driving Bentleys and other things. Now, I'm not saying that we should equate our Christianity and fellowship of God to wealth, material wealth, but there are instances in the Bible where God granted material wealth, blessings, and bling bling, and he received it from the Lord. He says not only that, I'm going to give you power and influence and honorable name. And if there is a qualifying question here, a contingent question, if you continue to walk in my ways of wisdom, I will grant you extension and expansion of your days on this earth and you will have a long life, a life, a, a extension of life for which you didn't even ask. Oh, sisters and brothers, I'm telling you, when you have wisdom, you get the whole shebang. Because oftentimes, if you have wisdom as the substratum gift that you've got in your life, then you can extend your life by acting right, by doing right. You can come into honor because you're doing the right thing at the right time. You're able to make right choices and wise decisions. I'm telling you, he asked for the right thing. And then God granted the rest. Sisters and brothers, when you ask for a heart of discernment and understanding, you are asking for wisdom. Because at the highest levels of your spirituality and religious commitments, wisdom, Sophia, Chaka, is all about having a heart that can discern between right and wrong. That which is good and that which is evil that which is hateful and that which is loving. Wisdom is all about having that inner insight which helps you and me to negotiate dangerous twists and turns and crazy places and crazy people and crazy spaces and toxic relationships and phony friendships. That innermost part of your being that has discernment which comes from God, that Sophia and Chaka from God can get you out of a whole lot of messes a whole lot of times, sisters and brothers, when you and I are tempted to lose our cool over something that won't make a difference two weeks from now, let alone two months from now, 
God's wisdom can instruct you to take a chill pill and go sit down somewhere before you say something or do something that is truly unwise. And then in wisdom, you button up those lips, zip it up, and have control of your tongue. That's wisdom. When you feel pushed to spend up some money, you should be saving for a rainy day and not cut up some cards that you shouldn't use. Something is pushing you, don't cut up those cards. Keep them in your wallet. Or to chase after some skirt or those pants that will only end in five to ten minutes of fun and pleasure maximum. Y'all know it only going to end in five, ten minutes pleasure maximum if you time everything. And then five to ten years of heartbreak, misery, regret, and bondage, God wisdom will talk you down from those pursuits. God's wisdom talks to you and offers you a better way, a way of self-denial, a way of self-discipline, a way where you say, in this situation, it looks good, but I've been taught from my ancestors that everything that looks good to me is not good for me. And as you listen to the voice of wisdom, wisdom can keep you safe and secure from all harm and alarm. And on your way to a quality of life and the joys of your Christ covenant commitments. And then God will grant you power. Oh, when you walk in wisdom, God will grant you power. There's some power that God cannot entrust uh, with folk who don't know that much about wisdom. Because God is wise. And God, in fact, he's the most wise God. We often talk about the most high God. The reason why he's the most high is because he's the most wise. He's the most loving. And God knows if I entrust my power in a person who's going to act foolishly, then I've just wasted my gifts on that person. Oh, but God will grant you power. If you claim God's wisdom and rely on God's wisdom, when you are drawn into some business venture or even to overextend yourself in church or in business and you're running around here, there, and everywhere, far and near, always on a commuter meeting in Zoom rooms and in rooms at the church or in rooms at work while your husband or wife or children or grandchildren, they're starving to connect with you. They're starving to smell life's flowers with you. God's wisdom will bubble up and over in your soul and have you to calm down and better manage your time, your commitments, your intimate relationships. A part of God's business is how we are to nurture our most important relationships with our closest family members and our friendships. How are you managing those relationships? Early on in the pastorate, I was always on the go. And I had to learn over the years that I've got to settle down. It took me about three years in uh, my pastoral service to realize I've got to operate at a different pace or else my family is going to miss me and I'm going to miss out on some of the most important blessings that are occurring in their lives. I'm not going to be able to connect with friends because I'm running around chasing a vision that might be more self-derived than God-derived. Solomon sought after wisdom first. Divine wisdom. But pastor, where and when does the journey on the pathway of wisdom begin? How does it start? Well, later Solomon would write in Proverbs chapter nine and verse 10, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is the starting point of wisdom. It is the source of wisdom, the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Let the writer's words gently flow through your mind and soul. The fear of the Lord or the awe of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is synonymous with understanding. The starting point of transitioning 
from being a fool to becoming wise is the question, how you answer the question, do you fear God? Not are you terrified of God, but that word fear means do you have a healthy and serious respect and awe of God? where you are sanctifying God in your life. That means setting apart God's will and purpose for your life first. If you do, welcome to the wisdom highway because you're traveling on it. Later in total harmony with this principle of first priorities, Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness and then everything else will be added unto you. Jesus says, seek first God's reign over your life, which involves engaging God's wisdom. Seek God's reign first, and all the other things will be added. Okay, preacher, I'm, I'm tired of asking you questions. One last question. From whence do we get this wisdom? Where does it come from? We know it begins with us fearing God sanctifying, respecting God, being in awe of God. Well, well, sisters and brothers, there's no way to enjoy the fruits of God's wisdom if we don't ever stop by the written accounts, the word of God captured by our faith and ethnic ancestors who wrote the word of God down as they were inspired by God to anthologize God's wisdom stories and teachings and accounts of folk who chose wisely and some folk who chose foolishly. We find God's wisdom in God's word and in the mouths of teachers and preachers and, and evangelists and counselors and therapists who respect God's word. And in addition to the scriptures and other works of spiritual in inspiration, that's where we find the wisdom of God. And in addition to hearing it through preachers and prophets and teachers and psychologists and counselors and therapists, for the follower of Christ, you've got an important, priceless teaching assistant in the person of the Holy Spirit. Oh, we thank God for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who can help you and me discern God's wisdom as we pray and regularly stop by this book, the Bible, the book of all books, and look in and meditate on its content day and night, rightly dividing the word of truth. And when we take this book with the Holy Spirit in our hearts, a fire of truth is ignited and we become hungry for more and more and more and more wisdom from God. As you meditate on what God did in the lives of the patriarchs and matriarchs, in the lives of Moses and Aaron and Miriam, the choices they made, good and bad, the way they came to know and hear God's voice. As you see how the prophets and the priests and holy griots live their lives in terms of how they gave, how they served, how they conducted themselves morally and sexually and ethically and spiritually, how they worshiped, how they confessed their sins, how they repented, how they treated other folks, especially when we come over to the New Testament era, and study the apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. As we study their lives, we gain wisdom. If we closely and meticulously above all other things, study the life of Jesus and note what he said and how he lived and how he moved and have, how he had his being, how he sought to heal, how he sought to cast out evil, and love on everybody he met, even as he told God's truth to everybody he met, then you will begin to only scratch the surface of wisdom. And then after scratching the surface, over time, after you studied Jesus and studied the apostles and studied the North African bishop, St. Augustine and Martin Luther and John Calvin and the founder of the CME church, I'm talking about some black heroes of the faith, Richard Allen and the black founder of Pentecostalism, William J. Seymour. After you study the women who preached 
and led like Jarena Lee and Julia Foote and men like Gardner C. Taylor and Dr. King, of course, and Professor Katie Cannon uh, out of the Presbyterian tradition and learn from the biographies of Medgar Evers and Shirley Chisholm and Mahalia Jackson and Fannie Lou Hamer and Thurgood Marshall and Barack and Michelle Obama as we learn from their glory, even the rough sides of their story, we gain wisdom. We gain wisdom. Oh, I praise God. You see, Calvary, as I take my seat, as I take my seat, God's wisdom is to be worked out in the health club of your life and then put to work in the factories of your soul and in your decision making out in the streets out among people and in sometimes very tough scandalous situations and choices that you've got to make God's wisdom is not to be dusted off and polished on a pedestal and admired from afar off in our churchy museums God's wisdom is to be lived out in the trenches where folk are speeding by you recklessly doing much more than 55 miles an hour where folk are getting on your last nerve and then standing on your last of your last nerves, where life throws you a curveball and you miss the curve, or when you come to some anxiety inducing fork in the road, that's when we've got to operate in the wisdom of God and know which way to go. It is then that we need to lean on God's wisdom the most because it is wisdom to live by. You know, I never told y'all how this worked in Solomon's life immediately. And if you read the rest of chapter three of our text in uh, Second Kings, you will find that after that prayer request, God immediately gave Solomon divine wisdom, an extra dose of it. Because not long after that experience he had with God, the Bible says that then a very dicey, difficult situation was presented to King Solomon. One day, these two women were invited to present their case to uh, the king's court and his judicial wisdom. When they came in, they were both women who had been involved in sex trafficking, the Bible tells us. Read the rest of chapter 3. And... Um, as they were involved in that kind of work, they had faults, y'all. They end up pregnant, both of them. One has a baby one day, the other one has a baby about two or three days later. They live in the same household. And as they're there trying to offer comfort and nourishment and nursing their babies, one of the two rolls over on their infant child, and the child dies. But she notices, hey, I see that my friend here, uh, she's asleep, and that baby is right lying next to her healthy. What I'm going to do is switch the babies. So she switches the babies in the night. They both wake up. The one whose baby had been taken wakes up and looks at this baby that's dead next to her. And she said, What's going this doesn't even look like my baby. So they end up presenting their case to the king. And the king has a serious decision to make. Now, some of us, upon hearing how he decided, we might think it was crude. We might think that it was unwise, but it worked. And that's what the wisdom of God does, no matter how strange it sounds, no matter how foolish it looks upon uh, those uh, for, uh, from those who are looking on the outside, it is still wisdom that works. And so the case is presented. He hears both of them. And he says, a servant, bring me a sword. He takes a sword. And he takes the baby and says, since y'all can't agree, we're going to split this baby right down the middle. And the one whose baby it wasn't said, go ahead and do it. That way neither one of us will have this baby. The other one said, listen. Let her have it, because whatever you do, don't cut up the baby. And then Solomon leans back on his throne of grace and wise judgment, and he says, I think I know now who the mother is. 
And he says the mother is the one who wanted to protect the baby at all costs. And he gives that baby to that mother. I don't know if the other sister was punished, but things will not go well for you in life when you operate foolishly and surreptitiously in an evil way and you're trying to set up other people that will be the end of you eventually but if you operate in God's wisdom and truth God can make that which seems unjust he can bring it around to God's justice and it worked out for the other sister and it probably totally changed her entire life sisters and brothers Solomon was granted that wisdom in the trenches of life we need that same kind of wisdom when we face decisions. We don't know whether to go right or left. We don't know who's telling the truth. We don't know who's lying. We don't know who's scheming. We don't know who's righteous. God can give you discernment through the very wisdom of God. Oh, sisters and brothers, let us stand to our feet as we celebrate God for a wisdom to live by. Maybe there's one to my left or to my right. You look over the, the artifacts of your life, the history of your life, the choices you've made, the decisions you've made. And you realize now, like never before, I have made some unwise choices. Welcome to the club. I've made several choices that I wish I could take back. I wish I could go back in time and have a mulligan, a redo, but I don't. But welcome to humanity. Everybody has that testimony. If you're wise, you admit it. We've made some bad decisions and choices, and yet Jesus has come to pay for it all. You don't have to pay for your sins. Jesus has already paid for your sins. And now I want you to live a life of wisdom, divine wisdom. Is there one to my left, to my right, you want to give your life to Jesus Christ? He will make your life brand new. What he's done for many others, he will do for you. Is there one to my left, to my right? Won't you come? We invite you to come forward if you need prayer. Some of you are facing some serious decisions. And you're not leaning on the wisdom of God. You're leaning on your own wisdom, according to your own understanding. I'm encouraging now to lean on the everlasting arms. Won't you come? If you had planned to go left, when you know God is saying, go right, you better go right. If you had planned to go right, and you sense the spirit is saying, you better go left, then go left. But don't make bad choices. Make the best choice you can today. Receive Jesus Christ as your savior. Is there one? We'll pray for, with you. If you already know the Lord, we'll pray with you. Online, you see the number on the screen. If you want to recommit your life or you need a church home, call that number. You may be seated in the presence of God.